is that, you know, call it five blocks. I was, you know, fucking playing tennis with Doug Stanhope, Mitch Hedberg, you know, talking to Mitch about the arguments he would have with Nick DiPaolo, who was his next door neighbor. He would bang on the door. You know, Ralphie May cooking barbecue fucking turkeys at six in the morning with Jay Moore in the backyard. And nobody had dough. I don't yeah. even, not even Ralphie. At that time, mm. Ralphie didn't have dough. No. It was just a fucking... Uh... You know what it was, Joe? <clears throat> you know what? When I, one of the reasons that I look back so fondly on it is because all this other bullshit that you realize is around, you're more aware of the bullshit the more successful you get because you're more exposed to it. But at the time, it was just that group of dudes all with the same goal just figuring out this, how to create. And, and it was all about that, dude. It was like, what bit are you doing? Going to watch somebody wait in line and watch them do their five minutes and work on a bit, talking about the bit act afterwards. It was so collaborative and it was really all just about us and, 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 and doing this, doing this job that we really also at the time, dude, you look back on a family because there was a strong love for what we did. We loved getting on stage. And I'm not sure that same passion. I don't know how you maintain that for however many years. But when I think, look, one of the reasons why I've changed so much about what I do on stage is because I need to keep it fun for me or else I'm going to get bored. And if I get bored, like you, I'm just going to stop, right? If I get bored, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to do that job anymore. So I've really started to mix up what I do on stage and it keeps me interested. I was never bored. I think it's very fucking exciting work. Uh, sitting here and not going on stage, reflecting a little bit every day, journaling. I had, I'm very proud of my open mic career. Most yeah. people will never say that in the world. You know, I had some ups and downs during my open mic career, but I really played it cool. And I didn't go anywhere. I didn't belong before my time. And we fucking really worked. And, you know, our common goal at that time was just to survive. Just to make it. We were living day to day. What mm -hmm. spots you got tonight? We're going to go to the coffee shop. And then swing by the improv, and then you know, I, I fucking love that journey. And it all goes back to 1998. This is the weirdest fucking thing. I I went to the Riviera to do the Dirty Show, and I got on a Southwest flight in Las Vegas, and I saw Slash got on the plane, and I didn't say nothing to him. I had seen him at the store a few times. We went to the Riviera, you know, the plane landed. I went to the Riv. I didn't think about it again. But there was a convention at the Riv, some type of convention, like a guitar convention. There was something going on downstairs. And I went downstairs to walk around, and I actually saw a Slash at a booth talking to people, signing pictures and shit. And I went over, and I go, hey, how you doing, man? He goes, good. And that was it. I didn't, you know, good to see you, you know, saw you at the store. Man, I was there with Chewy, you know, the whole fucking thing. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that night I was fucking bored as shit after the show. It's a midnight show. It's like a late show in Vegas, 11 o'clock. And I went downstairs to smoke a joint on the way back. I saw Slash there by himself. And I go, this is my chance just to ask him some questions, you know. And I went over. I was broke. I was lonely. I was bored. And, and we started talking. And. One thing led to another, and we actually started talking about careers and comedy and shit. And he's like, listen, you're broke right now, aren't you? And I go, yep. He goes, yeah, you're getting on stage every night, and you're writing. I, at that time, I think I did a movie, like I was in basketball or something. We were talking about that. Oh, I remember that. And he goes, listen, man, I want you to remember something. The best times you're going to have are right now when you're broke. This is the best. Once it becomes a business... Some people hate it, and they move on. That's what happened to Axel. He was telling me that that day. He goes, that's what happened to Axel. You know, he just snapped. He couldn't believe he had all that success in a rush, and he just didn't, he didn't smell the roses. 
and I, I'm really appreciative of my open mic career. Like, I, I'm really proud that I did the building correctly. Like, the, ba- the, bilking, the building blocks, I did them correctly. For two years, I just got on stage and improvised. You know, for two years, I got some material, and I would do a hybrid type of thing, improvise and do material. Then I started yelling, and then I moved to L.A., and I started... When you talk on stage in L.A., they ain't going for that shit. It's not New York City. Hey, where are you from? What do you do for a living? They fucking, you know, so that was the end of that. And then I went through the Rodney Dangerfield period, and then that didn't work. And then I finally realized that I had to tell stories to connect with people. And that's how we got to where we were. And it's just funny that I had a great time going to Milwaukee and Chicago and Zanies and, you know, all these theaters and shit but it didn't beat the time we had in Seattle. No, man. You know, didn't beat. I, the, the broke, but sitting down at that, I forget what that 24 hour cafe was out near where you hid in the trash can with Rico. Yeah. The, Trumpa- the, 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 the hurricane. Was it called the, the hurricane? hurricane? The hurricane. Yeah. The hurricane. Yeah. I remember going there after open mics and, you know, in Seattle, I didn't have money, but I had more money than everybody else because yes. of Lobo Loco. And I remember going there and like we'd buy like a, a pot of coffee with Brody and maybe Tana and we'd sit at the tables after open mics and just talk comedy just for the love of the comedy. And, and let me tell you, when I say bored, I'm never bored on like performing, but I like I like to challenge myself with something new every night because the new things, if I knew that if I know there's something new in my act, it fuels my entire act. The excitement of trying something that I haven't done before, you know, but but that excitement back then of not knowing, dude, we didn't know what to say or what was going to be funny. We just knew that we all shared this love for this thing. And it was really exciting, man. And I got to tell you, like, I'm really glad that that I feel lucky that I get to start with you and Brody. I feel really lucky. You guys, you guys taught me a lot because you guys had a different path than me. I don't want to say my path was easier, but especially early on, you guys were extreme people. You know what I mean by that? I, I could step on stage and fit in. Do you know, you guys had to find your people. Yes. Yes. And and so I was always fascinated by you guys because watching you even on the way up ma- maneuver that we're like I said, for me easier, the way I look I'm a white dude, I'm going to kind of fit into most rooms that I stand on stage. You two were, and I'm kind of middle of the country, relatable kind of person. You guys are ext- were extremes. 